Rolling one. We actually that was very melodramatic. <laughs> All right. Um, so can you can you just explain your just give us a sort of brief overview of your childhood? Speak louder. Can you just give us a brief overview of your childhood growing up in Texas and, and spending summers in uh, West Yellowstone? Okay. Well, I was born in Temple, Texas. Uh, one of three kids. My father was a school teacher, and uh, from Temple, Texas. Uh, when I started first grade in 1936, he started in the same school as a math teacher. After a, a few months, he became the principal in that school. And then when I graduated from that little grammar school and went to, to a junior high, he graduated also and became the principal of that school. So, but because he was in a school business, we had three months, summer, uh, summer months off. And we always went to Yellowstone for the first few years we camped at Fishing Bridge inside Yellowstone, put up a big tent for three months. And then after a few years, maybe when I was about seven or eight, uh, we moved over to West Yellowstone, Montana, which is on the western uh, edge of Yellowstone Park. And my father built a motel uh, uh, up there. And then in later years, I think in 1962, I also built a motel. So we have, we have a lot of fond memories of, about Montana and Wyoming and Yellowstone and, and the surrounding areas. So what kinds of things would you do while you, what kind of things would you do while you were on summer vacation with, uh, with your family in Yellowstone? Well, I remember one time telling my father that I was on vacation for three months. He said, you're not on vacation. He said, if you don't get a job, you're going to work for me. And he says, you're not going to like that. So I got a job. I had all kinds of jobs. I washed, I washed dishes at a, the Totem Cafe for 50 cents an hour, two consecutive eight-hour shifts. So after, after 16 hours, my hand looked like I needed an emergency room. I made eight bucks. And so, but I was a lumberjack. I cleared trails for the Forest Service. Uh, I was a professional fishing guide at age 13. I'd take clients out. I knew wherever fish was in that whole area. And... Uh, 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 we'd catch fish in the morning, and then I'd cook it. I'd cook it out on the stream uh, for lunch, and then we'd come in about five or six o'clock in the afternoon. We always had fish. Describe, um, describe the first treasure that you ever found. Well, the first treasure I ever found was a 17-year-old girl in Temple, Texas, going to high school. <laughs> Her name was Peggy Proctor, she, and. Uh, uh, we started dating, and, and uh, I think about seven or eight years later, we married. But uh, as you, if you're talking about artifacts, you know, I, I'm an amateur archaeologist and, a, and an avid outdoorsman. In my younger years, I was always out in the woods someplace. And uh, 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 being, I was a fighter pilot in the Air Force for 20 years, which means I travel all over the world. Arch and uh, I was always excavating in Libya or, or uh, at Pompeii uh, and, some, and all over Germany. You know, I didn't do a lot of excavating, but I did a lot of surface hunting and uh, it was very rewarding to me. I like to be out in, in, out in the fresh air. What about this one case? Uh, I think you found like an arrowhead when you were really young. Do you, do you remember well, that? I was with my father. I was nine years old and he said, let's go arrowhead hunting. I said, okay. And we went out to a friend's farm. Uh, uh, near Cameron, Texas, and he had just plowed a field. And I, I, my father was an arrowhead collector, and he had a lot of them. So was my football coach, and we all hunted together usually. But I remember when I found my first arrowhead, and, and I, uh, I've thought about it a million times at a very important point in my life. And I keep telling myself that that little arrow point had been laying there for 1,500 years waiting for me to come along. Wow. Um. When did you move from Texas to New Mexico? Well, I was born and raised in Texas. I joined the Air Force in 1950 when I was one month past 20 years old. And essentially that's when I left Texas because uh, the Air Force, they ship you all over the world. But uh, uh, I went to Vietnam in 1968 for a year. And when I came back, I went back to Lubbock, Texas uh, to teach pilot training. And then I retired in 1970 after 20 years of service, and that's when my wife and I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And whose idea was it? 
you know, I, I like the people in Lubbock, Texas, but it was it was flat. You know, I mean, you you could see 500 miles in any direction, uh, and it just didn't suit me. I needed water and I needed mountains, so I think it was my idea uh, to, to to go to Texas. But anything that I wanted to do, my wife would say, "Okay," and off we went. I mean, I, next month we will have been married 61 years. Wow. Um, you you just said that you, it was your idea to go to Texas. Do you mind just saying that it was your idea to go to New Mexico? Say that again. You just when you spoke, you said that it was your idea to go to Texas, and I think you meant New Mexico. Do you mind just re-saying that? No. Uh, in 1955, I became aide to uh, aide de camp to a two-star general, and um, I met a lot of friends along when I was his aide, a lot of generals, and so from that point on, I was able to select whatever assignment that I wanted. Uh, and, and so when, when I went to Vietnam in 1968, my wife was waiting for me in Lubbock. She had asthma, and Lubbock was a good place for her to be. And so uh, I arranged to, to be assigned, reassigned back to Lubbock, and I retired there in 1970. Okay. Um, how did you come up with the idea to start an art gallery? Uh, when I retired from the Air Force, I had a wife and two kids. My retired pay was something like 800 bucks a month. And uh, we could get by with that in, in those days. Uh, you, you know, we didn't drink many Coca-Colas or that sort of thing, but uh, uh, I needed a job. And uh, Santa Fe was the only place that I knew where, uh, uh, where I could recover. I had, a, I had a bad tour in Vietnam. I was shot down twice. I took battle damage a number of times. I lost a few roommates. And I lost 22 pounds and didn't even know that I, that I had lost it. So when I came back from Vietnam, I was, I was beat up mentally and I was beat up physically. And uh, uh, Santa Fe was, was the place for me because uh, I knew I wasn't gonna wear a coat and tie and I was gonna wear short sleeve shirts and blue jeans and hush puppies. And Santa Fe was the only place I knew where I could do that. And uh, along the way, I, uh, I decided that, that I didn't want to, I wanted to deal in luxuries. Uh, I didn't. I didn't want to do anything where my best client gave me 500 bucks or 100 dollars. I'm talking about one-hour Martinizing, J.C. Penney, the restaurant business. I mean, you could go on and on. I wanted to deal in luxuries, uh, so I wouldn't have to worry about the check clearing. And and uh, uh, it started working for me after a couple of shows. Why well, I started making a few bucks. And in your in your gallery, you had a sort of different policy about. Um you know, whether people could touch the art or not. Can you explain that? When I, when I first got into business in Santa Fe and built my gallery, I, I'd, I'd never been to college, I'd never studied business, I'd never studied art. I tell people I never learned the rules that make businesses fail. But I was up on Canyon Road one time and I went in a little kachina shop. It was called, I think, the kachina shop. And two little old ladies ran it and they were pretty strict and I walked in that shop for the first time and the kachina dolls were just stacked everywhere. I mean there were hundreds of them and the aisles were narrow and I, I saw little, sign, little signs around on the tables. If you touch it you bought it. You are responsible for your kids. Do not touch in big red letters. I just scared me to death. I put my hands in my pockets and tried to sneak out the door before I uh, I had to go to jail for breaking a kachina doll, but I learned something from that. I went back to my gallery and I, I made a number of signs and put them different places on the tables and on uh, pedestals that said, uh, please touch, I am responsible. How can you buy something if you're not allowed to touch it? I never understood that philosophy. In 17 years in business in Santa Fe, I never had a client break anything. I had some people work for me break a few things, but uh, uh, and I always wanted to touch things. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hands-on person. I, would, I like to pick things up and look at them. Are you um, mischievous as well? Is there like a, a sort of, you know, the idea of creating a game for people out of this treasure? I mean, does that sort of play into it? I'm, I'm not sure I understand your motive in that question. Do you have like a, a, a sort of, you know, uh, a side that likes to play games? In business? No, in, in just in, in... You're talking about the treasure? Yeah. No, no, I don't think so. The, my treasure story, there's nothing, there's nothing gamesmanship about that. It's just cut and dried and everything you, you need to know is there. There's, there, there. there's no subterfuge any place with that. Interesting. Okay. 
Um, you uh, you mentioned that you are a fly fisherman. Can you is there sort of a similarity between the idea of being a treasure hunter and trying to chase trout in a river? Well, the only similarity is that you got to be outside to do both. And 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 I was I can't tell you how many thousands thousands of miles that I've walked through the desert and through the mountains and along the streams and around the lakes just looking for things. You know, uh, I, I always like to walk up on a beaver dam, for instance. I love I love that kind of thing. But I, uh, I, over the years, I, I found, I think I have 3,300 projectile points that I found. And you find all, all sorts. I was with a, a friend here in Santa Fe about 15 years ago. We were walking way up someplace and he picked up a fully loaded Colt 1860 model army pistol. Wow. Somebody lost it there probably 100, 200, 150 years ago and uh, uh, he found that thing. I mean it's it's a thrill. It's uh, And I name, I call my book that, The Thrill of the Chase. It's the thrill of the chase. But you don't always, like when you go fishing or when you go treasure hunting or you're just out, you don't always find what you're looking for but is that is that necessarily the point? You know, when I'd go fishing, whether I caught any fish or not, it didn't really matter to me. Uh, I can remember telling myself, you know, I can hardly wait to get out on a stream. And I get out there and I put my rod together and I look around. And ospreys and eagles are flying around. And I just go over there and sit under a tree. I may sit there for an hour before I even start fishing. It's, it, uh, there's a quote in the new Joe Devine book. They never knew that it was the chase they sought and not the quarry. Yeah. Was that part of your motivation? Can, can you explain? Was that part of your motivation in creating this treasure hunt? The thrill of the chase? Yeah, sure. I'm trying to share that with you. I, I had several motivations. One, one of my motives, uh, my main motive in, in writing the book and hiding the treasure was to... Uh, was to get kids off the off the couch today, away from their little texting machines, and we have a problem in this country with our youth. We're obese, and I I don't want to get into that. But yeah, we need we need uh, for the kids to go out and smell the sunshine, and and by hiding the treasure chest, it was a good way for for a man and his wife to get the kids out and not only fishing but exploring. Uh, uh, nature is a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, I had several motives though too. As a matter of fact, a lady from, uh, a reporter from Texas called me on the phone and she said, Mr. Finn, I've read your book. She said, that's a very strange book. She said, who is your audience for that book? I said, lady, my audience is every redneck in Texas that's, that, with a wife and 12 kids who lost his job, but he has a pickup truck. I said, that's my audience. Tell him to throw a bedroll in the back of his truck and head out. And uh, I stopped counting, I stopped keeping most of my emails when I hit 65,000. But about probably 40,000 of those emails have said, Mr. Finn, we know we're not going to find a treasure, but thank you for getting me and my family out in the sunshine and, and smell the fresh air. Yeah. They, a lot of day with, today with kids, they don't want to go out in the countryside but once they get out there they say wow you know why didn't we do this before and and so you know there there's a very fortunate byproduct that that came along with the treasure story why we said uh, we're going to turn over okay willing to so why why use um why use a poem well, I had, I, when I had the treasure chest, uh, uh, I had the treasure chest before I, I knew what I was going to do with it. But I needed a vehicle to, so that people, I needed a vehicle that would tell people where the treasure chest is if they could figure it out. And I, I told myself the, the best way to do that is write a poem. So I wrote the poem, and, and I think there's. Uh, 24 stanzas maybe, uh, I don't remember, but there are nine clues in that poem. If you can follow the clues, starting at the first one, they will take you to the treasure. Are the clues like, um, are they like, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
are they like misleading or like twisted or are they just like clear? Can you explain the, that? The, 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 there's no subterfuge in that poem. Everything is straight, straightforward and the tendency with thousands of people that are searching, they, <coughs> they tend to overcook the poem. I tell people to, to, to read the book and then study the poem four, five, six, eight, ten times. And then go back and read the book again slowly, looking for hints in, in the text that will help you solve the clues in the poem. That's the way to do that. Yeah. But you have to know where to start. If you don't have the starting point, you don't have anything. You and I, and I've said that the, 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 the treasure is hidden in the Rocky Mountains somewhere north of Santa Fe. By the starting point, you mean the starting point in the book or the starting point in the uh, In the poem. The and and you, you need to know where the first clue is in the poem. You have to find that spot. From then on, it's academic. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you had a, uh, going back to your military service, uh, you had a couple of close calls. Can you just give us a brief explanation of either one or both of those? Uh... I don't remember how many times I took battle damage flying the F-100 in, in, in Vietnam, but uh, it, it, it was exciting. The first time I was shot down was in the south of Vietnam in a Delta region, and uh, I, the first time I knew I'd been hit, I looked out at my wings and fuel was pouring out of the bottom of the wings. I had a 50 caliber bullets go right through my wings, and the, the wings are full of fuel. so. I looked at how much fuel I had left and how far I had to go, and I told myself, you know, I'm not going to make it. I had about 60 miles to go, and I didn't have 60 miles of fuel left. But I told my, I kept telling myself, I don't want to jump out because somebody's going to shoot me in a parachute, and I, I knew I didn't want that to happen. So, But I said, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to get as close as I can. And about two or three miles out on final, my engine quit, ran out of fuel. And I told myself, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And all of a sudden, I dropped the gear and dropped the tail hook. And I and, and touched down on the runway. And the tail hook engaged a big, heavy anchor chain, boat anchor chain. And I think I touched down at about 240 knots. And I stopped in 300 feet. Whoa. I mean, it takes 10,000 feet to stop an F-100. Yeah. It jerked the back end of the airplane off. It strained, strained my back. I was in a shoulder harness and, and strapped in tight. But, you know, that was... That was a uh, make your pulse quicken just a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, sorry, I got a little bit sidetracked there. Um, can you tell us what's actually in the treasure box? Can you just explain? You, you asked me about both times I was shot oh, down. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. The second time I was shot down was on the 20th of December, 1968, in Laos. I was I was uh, dropping a. Uh, landmines on the Ho Chi Minh Trail near Chapone. And I knew, I knew that on the, the several days before my mission, uh, we had lost a couple of Navy airplanes and some airplane, uh, Air Force airplanes on that same target. So uh, the, the, the mission required for me making two passes at about 500 feet above the ground and, and as fast as I could travel. And that was about at that, at that low altitude, the F-100 doesn't want to go real fast, but I was going about 600 knots. And uh, I think I got hit on the first pass. And I, I designed that pass to, uh, to, to going into the sun to surprise the guns. And then I was going to pull up in Whifferdale and come back uh, out of the sun hoping to blind the guns. Well, I think they hit me going in, they, and I know they hit me coming out because they, they shot the canopy off my airplane. and big jagged pieces of plexiglass were looking at me right here and and uh, uh, I looked at my gauge it looked like a Christmas tree what you don't want to see on an instrument panel in an, in a fighter are yellow lights and red lights because yellow means danger and red means get out so uh, I was shot up pretty good and I got about but I had a lot of airspeed so I pulled up and and made a, another pass because I saw the guns that, that shot me down. They were above me on the side of a hill. Uh, and, and, and so I heated up my, my 20 millimeter high explosive incendiary gun bullets and I, I shot those guys. I, not, not so much to, uh, to aiming at the target, but I wanted to mark where the gun was because I had three wingmen that, that, that were loaded for bear. And so they, 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 
they shot the guns up pretty good, but I had I still had some airspeed after my engine quit, and I think I got about 30, 40 miles away to what looked like a remote port of the Laotian jungle. And I, I waited till the last minute again because I didn't want to get shot in a parachute, so I jumped out at about a thousand feet above the ground, and and it, it, it was it was the whole thing was wonderful. I mean, everything worked, and uh, you know. I, this is where I, you saw the small clearing in the in the forest. Say what? This is where you saw a small clearing in the jungle that you wanted to go. No, back no, to that, later? that that was that was much earlier. Oh, okay. That was, but I later met the airman that packed my parachute, and. Uh, I got to know him. I bought him a couple of beers and thanked him for doing a good job on that, on that packing my parachute for me. Yeah, sure. Um, do you mind? Do you mind sort of just condensing that down and just sort of explaining that you were shot down twice while flying in Vietnam? Uh, I was shot down twice during the Vietnam War. The first time was in the Delta region of Vietnam, down below Saigon, and the second time was in was in Laos on Ho Chi Minh Trail. Near, our, my target was Chapon, which was right in the middle of, of the trail where all the munitions came in from from uh, North Vietnam into the south. Gotcha. Okay. Did um, that answer your question? Yeah, that's perfect. perfect. That's perfect. Um, can you just explain a few of the things, the, the physical items that are in the treasure chest? Well, when, when I decided that I was going to hide the treasure chest, I was fortunate to find a beautiful little 10-inch square Romanesque cast bronze treasure chest that, that was beautiful. And I started, it took me a while, a couple of years to, to fill that thing up with things that I wanted to, I wanted the treasure chest to, to be visual, enough to excite someone's imagination. And I wanted it to be worth enough money so that to, to in, inch them out the door and into the woods. And, and uh, so that meant, but yet the treasure chest was small and so I had to, uh, everything said gold and rubies and diamonds and emeralds and sapphires. And so that's what I did. There are 265 gold coins in, in that treasure chest. Most of them are American eagles and double eagles. There are some, some ancient Middle Eastern gold coins. I, I, don't, I can't read the dates, but I think we're talking 12th, 13th, 14th century. Uh, there's a lot of pre-Columbian. There's probably 10 or 12 ancient pre-Columbian artifacts, gold frogs. There are two uh, ancient Chinese carved jade figures uh, that are wonderful. I mean, uh, and, and there's some, there's a, a, a wonderful fetish necklace from the Sinu and Tyrona cultures. A, a carved fetish is made from quartz crystal and uh, chalcedony and, and uh, even some, some bronze, ca I mean, cast gold jaguar claws. Uh, and then, uh, I said in my book, I think I said in my book, when, I, when the treasure chest was ready to go, I had a little a bracelet, a silver bracelet with 22 disc turquoise beads in it. The turquoise beads had been found by Richard Wetherill at Mesa Verde the very first day he discovered Mesa Verde in the late 1800s. He crawled down into that place and picked up those 22 little turquoise beads. About 1903, an Indian working for Richard Wetherill exc excavating Mesa Verde made that row bracelet for him. And the thing about it is it fit me perfect. And uh, about, I think, Rich, uh, I think he sold it to Fred Harvey, I think, in 1903 or sometime like that. And, and when Fred Harvey died, that in, his entire collection was, uh, was acquisitioned into the Heard Museum in Phoenix. Well, I, I won that little bracelet in a pool game, shooting pool with Fred Harvey's grandnephew, Byron Harvey. And that's how I acquired that thing. So it has sentimental value to me, but that was the last thing I put in a treasure chest. And, I, and the thought came to me when I put that in the treasure chest and closed the lid, the thought came to me that a little part of me is in that treasure chest also. Yeah, but you also put your, you put your memoir in there or, your, or a biography of yourself. Well, I, say, I said in my book that my mem memoir was 28,000 words. Actually, it's 32,000 words, but 
uh, that's a lot of words to put in a little treasure chest. So I took it to Kinko's and printed it so small. I mean, I printed it with their smallest font and I have to use a magnifying glass to read it. But, but I put it in a little olive jar. You know those cute little olive jars with a screw on lid. But the lid didn't make that jar watertight. Uh, so I, I heated up some microcrystalline wax and I, dro I, I dipped that the lid of that little jar in, in the hot wax to seal it. I guarantee you water's not going to get in, in that jar. So, and I, I took, I pulled one, a couple of my hairs and I put those in the jar because, you know, if that, if that thing is found a thousand or ten thousand years from now, maybe they'll, somebody will want to do some DNA tests or carbon-14 or whatever, and they'll find out who this idiot was that, that did this outrageous thing. Um, yeah. Um, are you wor are you worried that the chest is out there like getting wet or weathered or? I know that it's wet. I mean, I, I never did say that I buried it. That doesn't mean it isn't buried. But if, if something's in in the Rocky Mountains, I mean, how is it not going to get wet? It gets rained on in the summertime. Even if it was buried, it's going to get wet. And if it's not buried, it's going to get cold and wet. Right. <laughs> with snow and whatever. So I, I know the thing is wet, but, but I was careful. Uh, I tried to think of those things. There, uh, there's a couple of bracelets in there. One, one of the bracelets has a steel hinge on it. I knew that that was going to rust. So I put it in a couple of Ziplocs and, you know, I don't know what the life expectancy of a Ziploc is, but, but certainly not a thousand years. But any, anyway, I'd, I did what I could, you know, I mean, there's so many things to think about. And, and uh, uh, one of the things that was paramount in my mind was that I didn't want to go home and say, oh, geez, I forgot that. Too late for oops. Yeah. Um, do you want the treasure to be found in your lifetime? You know, I've been asked that question. Uh, do I want the chest to be found in my lifetime? I've been asked that question a thousand times, and I've got, I can say honestly that I'm totally ambivalent about that. You know, ye yes or no. Part of me says yes, but a part of me says no. So, you know, it's out of my hands now. I mean, that treasure chest is, a, is part of a historic doc document that, I mean, the Rosetta Stone was buried 2,000 years, and I said in my book that don't you know the guy that carved that thing is proud of himself 2,000 years later that it was found? So that's why I look at that. What do you want your legacy to be? You know, I don't want a legacy. A legacy is something that happens to you after you're dead, and I don't want to control. I have no control over that. It, uh, uh, but to answer your question, I mean, there's going to be a legacy whether I like it or not. And if the, until the treasure chest is found, uh, my name is going to go be an asterisk in the book that talks about that treasure chest. And, and you've got to say that that's a legacy. But uh, uh, also, I, I don't know whether you know it or not, but I'm, I've made a number of uh, cast bronze jars and bells that, that, that I have buried in the desert and in the mountains. I've buried eight of them, and I buried them so deep that a, a metal detector can't find them. And, and so remotely that I couldn't go back to them myself and find them. And uh, I can see one of those things being dug up 10,000 years from now when somebody's making a footing for a building or something and, and they're going to screw off the, that jar and find my autobiography in there in, the, in, the, in a little olive jar and they're going to read that thing and say, good Lord, look at, look at this guy 10,000 years ago what he did. So I'm going to be famous. Okay. Rolling three. Um, all right. Uh, what do you say to people who think you're crazy or a public nuisance or that you're like getting people to dig up outhouses or graves or national parks or any of that kind of stuff? I pretty much agree with them. <laughs> I mean, how, how can you be a maverick? You know, I... Uh, I hope, I hope somewhere in my distant past there was a pirate because uh, I have that inst instinct in me, I think. I mean, I don't want, uh, 
I never wanted to break the law, but I wanted to bend some of them a little bit. You know, how do you know where the edge is if you don't go out there and look? And I'm not the type of person that you'll find walking down the center line. It's just not part of me. Do you feel like you want to inspire, like, inspire other people to, to have those feelings or to do things that are a little different than they would normally do? I don't know that I can inspire anybody. To, I mean, a, a personality is a personality. If you don't have it in you, then you can just laugh and go play canasta. You know, that's the way a lot of people are. But, but I have inspired some people because I, they've told me that by emails. You know, I would never have gone to Yellowstone or to Yosemite or, or to Bandelier if, if you had not lured me out there with this treasure story. Yeah. Um. Can you, can you just give us the sort of uh, condensed version of your cancer diagnosis and when that was and what type of cancer you were diagnosed with? Well, in 1988, uh, for a year or so, I'd had a small pain in my, in my lower groin, just a very insidious little, not an ache, it wasn't even a pain, but it, it was consistent. And so after a while, I did, I, I went to the hospital, I went to a doctor, and he said, well, let, I don't think there's anything to it, but let's run some tests. So they gave me this stuff to drink, and, and the first time I knew I was in problem, I was laying on, on a bed in the hospital, and this nurse says, quick, girls, come over and look. I knew I was in trouble when she said that, and it turned out that, that my right kidney wasn't working. She had never seen a body that had one kidney. And so it was a novelty for them, but uh, at my expense. <laughs> but I called a friend in Phoenix who was uh, president of the Maricopa County Medical Association. I, I said, Bob, find me the best urologist in America. So a couple of days later, he called me with the name uh, Taylor Floyd in Albuquerque. Uh, Taylor Floyd had probably, I think at that time, he was the only doctor in New Mexico that could transplant some of the organs. So I went to see him and, and he said, well, just because your kidney isn't working doesn't mean you have to take it out. He said, uh, you can leave it in, but since you have a little pain there, let's take it out. I said, what are the chances of being cancer? He said, 5%. I said, okay. So a two hour operation turned into five and he told me I had a 20% chance of living five years. So that's when the treasure, th I said, if I've got to go, who says I can't take it with me? Sure I can, I'm not gonna live by everybody else's rules. Uh, and that's when I got the idea to, to hide a treasure chest. Sure I can take it with me. Did you, did you get this idea from, from somebody or from something or did it just strike you in the... It, 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 was, it, just, it just came to me, I thought I was gonna die. 20% chance, uh, one out of five is not very good. But I told myself, if I've got to go, I want to do it on my terms. I don't, I don't want to die in a hospital room with, with everybody around gawking at me with tubes all down my throat. I said, I want to die in the mountains or along the stream or something. I said, I said dying, dying is very personal. It's something you have to do all by yourself. And to be frank about it, I don't want anybody watching. So I told myself, I'm going to write this poem. I'm going to hide this treasure. And with my last, if I have another terminal illness, my last dying gasp will be to go out there and where that treasure chest is and take my own life on my own terms. That, that's, that's important to me. Yeah. Um, the, the problem was that I got well, you know, it, it ruined the story. But I said, well, I, can, I can still hide the treasure chest and that was 1988 and I'm, I'm still around kicking. I'm, Mostly vertical now. Does that mean that you? Does that mean that you hid the chest in 1988? Have you said when? No, you, that's when I got cancer in 1988. Have you said when you hid the chest or what year? I have. I have not said when I hid the treasure chest because that's a clue that I don't want to give. But I can say that I was either 79 or 80 years old when I did that. And I tell people, don't go looking for a treasure chest on top of the mountain someplace where a 79 or 80 year old man can't can't take it up there right right um okay okay i don't feel like i'm giving you guys very much no no this is great we're, we're, i think i think it's great we'll, we'll, we'll ask some harder questions that you'll want to say no to soon enough here. <laughs>
<laughs> like, where's the treasure? <laughs> All right. um, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, can you just explain um, what was your motivation for hiding this thing in a beautiful place or, you know, in the Rocky Mountains or your relationship with nature? When I decided to hide that treasure chest, I knew exactly where I was going to go, where I was going to put it. It's, a, it's in a place that's very dear to me, and uh, I, I don't want to get too far into that because it'll give you a time frame, that, and that's a clue that I don't want to reveal. But, but uh, there was never a second choice. There was never a second choice. But I will say that that the person that finds that treasure chest is somebody that's going to figure out the clues and he's going to go to it. He's not, nobody's going to happen upon it. I mean, nobody's going to find it out on a Sunday afternoon picnic or during spring break. I mean, they're going to have to, they're going, they're going to earn it. Yeah. But I've also said, and I believe this with all my heart, the person that finds that treasure chest and puts it on their lap and raises that lid for the first time they're either going to start crying or they're going to start laughing or they're going to collapse, one of the three. I don't, but it's, it's, it's such a visual sight. Emeralds and rubies and diamonds and sapphires and gold and, and antiques and jade, carved jade. <laughs> it's pretty atrocious when you get right down to it. Yeah. Uh, so, your inspiration, na nature? Na I mean, throughout what? Your, your life in nature, I mean, what really... In the course of your life, what role has nature played in just in your life? I mean, obviously, from fishing to just all of your exploration. I mean, what just your relationship with nature? Well, describe it? what part has nature played during my life? Well, I, I don't know for sure, but I think when I, I was born looking out of a window, and I never stopped looking out of the window in, in high school. In high school, I, I sat by a fire escape. You, the, and the window was open when the weather was good and when the teacher wasn't looking, I could climb through that window and slide down an old iron fire escape. I mean, the, the, the lure of the smell of freedom was uh, superseded anything that the teachers had to teach me. And that's why I made D's and F's in all my, I think I graduated because my father was a principal. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I, I never felt like I, like they had anything for me. I just, they certainly didn't have anything that, that would command my attention. This one, this one teacher, Spanish teacher, she said, she said, Forrest, don't you know anything? I said, Miss Ford, I don't even suspect anything. And then the bell rang and I got out of there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you say, what do you say to the, the, these recent reports uh, that, the, that the treasure has been found? I, I put that guy's name on a list with about 45 other names of people who say they have, they have the chest in their position and they're looking at it. And I'll say, well, d did the hot water have any effect on the gold coins? And they, they say, well, hot water? I say, thank you and hang up the phone, you know, or, or because I gave, they thought I gave them a clue and they're going to go out and look for the treasure. And this one guy, I said, well, uh, uh, well, uh, will, will you, if you have the treasure, will you sell me the earrings? And he says, what earrings? So, so you know, I, I, uh, they, they, they try to bait me and I bait them right back. Because uh, none of them are willing to say where they found it or send photographs. Right. It's a dead giveaway that they don't have it. They need their 15 minutes and so... It's okay with me. This guy who, who, who had this theory about the, the warm water being people, soldiers crying at the Vietnam Memorial. Yeah. Can, can, you, oh, sure. can you respond to that? Oh, some of the emails that I get are so wonderful. This one little girl, I think she was about eight or nine years old, she sent me an email. She said, Mr. Finn, if I find a treasure chest, do I have to share it with my brother? I mean, that's the kind of monster that I'm glad I created with this thing. Um. Well, uh, I mean, can you can you give us you know can you give us something that will help people you know a tenth a tenth or eleventh or a twelfth clue the way that you that, that that will what? Crowd rush. Yeah, uh, you know, can you tell us some place that the treasure isn't buried, for example? Our, 
Well, the treasure is not buried where you're going to find it. That's the first thing. But people have have asked me for clues, and you know, sometimes it's just hard for me to say no. The first clue I gave was this lady in Minneapolis called me on the phone. She said, "She said you have to you have to help me out. Give me another clue." I said, "Okay, I'll give you a clue." I said, "The treasure is more than 300 miles west of Toledo." She said, "Oh, thank you." You know, she thought I'd really helped. Um, well, you mentioned you, you know you mentioned in the in the book that. Um Rolling four. So the base of the clue should be baked in the out as I've already said too much. Sure. So we, cryptic, yeah, yeah. Cryptic delivery. Um right. Yeah. In your book in your book you mentioned that there are other clues sprinkled throughout, you know, not just in the poem. Can you point us toward one of the one of the other ones that's that's in the book somewhere? No, there are no clues except in the poem. There are some hints in the book. The, uh, the hints won't take you to the treasure chest, but the clues will. But the hints will help you with the clues. So you know you have to go in the back door. But they're subtle. Uh, that's that's why I say read read the book uh, normally the first time, and then go back and and think about each sentence as you read it. Look at the pictures and. Uh, the drawings and and uh, in a very subtle way they can help you if 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 you if you have your mojo working. Yeah. Um, have you told Have you told anybody that it, that it's that it's wet before? You know, what? Earlier you mentioned that the treasure was wet. You know, you said I know. I, I can't hear you. Oh, you want to? Er, earlier you, know. you mentioned that the that you know the treasure was wet. Is that a, is it, is that a you know is that an admission that it's above ground like sitting out just sitting somewhere or is that no that's not an uh, the, I know the treasure chest is wet uh, uh, because physics says it's supposed to be wet right meteorology says it's supposed to be wet so uh, you know if I if I buried the thing twenty feet deep then you might make the argument that it isn't wet. But the Rocky Mountains are wet most of the time, the summer and winter both. And if it's not raining, it's snowing. And so uh, if, if I buried the thing six feet deep and I didn't, then it's going to be wet. Right. Yeah. Um, can, you, can, you say, uh, can you say whether it's buried or not? I've never said that it was buried, no, and I don't intend to. I don't, that's a clue that I don't want to reveal. I've never said that it wasn't buried. What about... Is it in New Mexico somewhere? It's in the Rocky Mountains somewhere. All right. Um, let me try, I'm trying to think of another. <clears throat> Have you said whether the House of Brown is a brown trout? No. First of all, I didn't say the House of Brown. I said the Home of Brown. Home of Brown. That's different. That's different. Uh, but, I, but I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Forrest, do you know, have you just, in terms of the clues that you have given, not asking for a new one, have you ever told people that you know the treasure is wet? What we're trying to do with this, just like, on, is basically explain, we want the delivery of this, you know, in this piece. You, you want what? Basically, our, our idea of, for this video is to basically have, we're not going to have you come out and say, here's a clue. You're looking for something new? No, no. All we, what we want to end with, honestly, is you saying, I've already said too much and make people think somewhere in what you've already delivered, there was a clue, but not, you know, kind of a poetic cryptic delivery is, is essentially what we're trying to say. So if you've never told people that the treasure is wet, then, we, then you already, the clue is already there. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Well, you've asked me a lot of questions and Sorry. some of them, I've, most of them I've answered, a few I haven't, but I gotta tell you, there's, there's one thing I told you that I wish I had not. Is that a good finish? That's a great. Yeah. That's a great finish. Do you mind saying that to me though instead? Yeah, just one more time to him. Just say exactly the same. What, thing. what did I say? <laughs> you said one thing. I, I told you. I've answered a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, I've been sitting with you here for about an hour talking to you, and I've answered most of your questions. There are a few questions I haven't answered, but one that I didn't answer. Now I wish I had not. Can you say I've already said too much? I've already said too much. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, there were, and then there were a couple of things from your book, a couple of lines from your book 
that uh, that we liked it. We thought we could just read to you and see if you would say them back to us. Uh, there was one that says, what do you think? For me, it was always the thrill of the chase. Is that a question? No. That was a line from your book. I was wondering if you would just say that one back to us. Oh. You know, there are a lot of good things in this life. Uh, and uh, when you boil it all down, it, it, it comes right down to, to the thrill of the chase. You need to do it for yourself. Don't, don't ask for help from somebody else if you can do it. Go out there and do it yourself. It's the thrill of the chase. That's excellent. Um, now, when we, when we met with you uh, last week, you mentioned about being able to uh, tie a certain number of flies to sell in a certain amount of time. Can you explain that? Well, when I was 12 or 13 years old in West Yellowstone, I worked in a tackle shop that was owned by a guy by the name of Don Martinez. I had to love Don Martinez, but he was drunk most of the time. So I'd open a shop about 8 o'clock in the morning, and, and I'd work all day long tying flies. I tied catgut leaders, tapered leaders. I, uh, I, I made a few uh, split bamboo rod, fly rods. And uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of business, but I could sit there behind the, the counter and tie flies. And, and one day I just, I, I just counted how many flies I made just for my own interest. And I'd made 144 flies and waited on customers all at the same time. But, but uh, 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 when I was tying flies, I could do it without thinking. And when, it, uh, when I do things without thinking, that gives me time to think. That's great. Uh, and then there was one other line, it'll make you rich with adventure. What? It'll make you rich with adventure. Did I say that? That was in your book. That I'm rich with adventure? No, it was, that was, oh, that was in, in the video. Oh, no, sorry. it's more inspiring, inspiring people. I mean, the adventure of, you're inspiring people to go out and, and, and look for this. And, and in doing well, so, you're, you know, what, what are you trying to inspire? People? Well, uh, my last two books were The Thrill of the Chase and then Too Far to Walk. And both of them are, are, are full of adventures, stories, and things. And I hope that I'm inspiring uh, particularly young people to, to go out and, and emulate some of those stories. Do it for yourself. Go, go out and, and uh, generate your own memories. It, you're, you, you don't ever get any younger. The time is, is drawing nigh for all of us. Yeah. Go do it yourself. It's the thrill of the chase. I think that's mostly got it. Is there, any, you know, is, is there anything else that you want to... To, to deliver to us to, to help uh, get people excited for next summer's, uh, you know, hunt, treasure hunting season? Uh, you know, there's no way to, to measure the impact that my treasure story has had. But I think that, that, that we took 10,000 people through Yellowstone Park that would not have gone this last summer. And the, the occupancy rate in the motels in Santa Fe is up 6.2% over last year. And some people credit the treasure story with, with bringing people to town. To, and, uh, and so many of them uh, send me emails and, and want to meet me, you know, and I just can't meet everybody. I wish I could, but I, I would have to. I would, they, they, want me to, they want to shake my hand and, and want me to sign their book. And I hate to tell them no, but I could spend, I could see 25 people a day if I said yes. I do say yes to some people, but it depends on what mood I'm in. But, but I, I've got, I've, I've written 10 books and I have three more. I have one that's being laid out now, my greatest effort probably. But I have three more in my computer that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm being distracted from. And uh, I think to the point now I've pretty much given up uh, and uh, I can probably say that I won't finish those books. Descriptions of landscape, descriptions of basically being inspired by landscape. Kind of what, about, what about like um, if you could picture yourself where you were standing on the treasure, can you describe like what it looks like in this area? Like what, like, you know, what the whether it's a, is it a beautiful place or just give us a sort of like vague description of, of the place where it is. If, if I was standing where the treasure chest is, I'd see trees, I'd see mountains, uh, I, I'd see animals, uh, I'd, I'd smell wonderful smells of pine needles or, or pinyon nuts or whatever, uh, sagebrush, uh, that's that's what I that's what 
that those are the impulses that would that would come to mind. I, I don't want to I, I don't want to say any more than that. That's great. That's perfect. Okay.